Hola, bienvenidos a todos. My name is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, welcoming you to tonight's special edition of En Casa con la Plaza. En Casa con la Plaza is our virtual programming. We've been at it since April of 2020, bringing the best of our culture, history, and art from our home to yours, even as we're opening up. If you've joined us on Zoom, please use the chat feature to uh, let us know where you're viewing from. Q&A is there, you could ask questions. We'll probably be taking them towards the end of today's presentation, but we'd like to know where you're zooming in from. Those of you who have joined us on Facebook, same. You have the comment section. Let us know where you're view viewing from. Also, you could ask questions, make comments. I'll be monitoring it all. And towards the end of our conversation presentations today, we'll be asking those questions. So thank you very much for joining us. Before we get started, just want to give you some updates on La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. We opened up back in April 15th, very limited, uh, from Thursday to Friday, 12 to 4. But now that we've opened up, thanks to all of you who have gotten vaccinated, keeping safe. Now we're uh, starting tomorrow. We'll be open on uh, regular hours, 12 to 5 o'clock on Wednesday, Thursday, and Mondays. And then on Friday, Saturday, and Sundays from 10 to five o'clock. You can make reservations by going to our website, lapca.org, or you can come on and stand by. Uh, we'll still be uh, following some COVID uh, safeguards, including masking, social distancing. In the meantime, as we continue to open up and stay safe. Uh, if you haven't been to La Plaza in a while, we have a couple of exhibitions that I'm sure you'll really enjoy. Afro Latinidad, Mi Casa, My City, and Carlos Almaraz, uh, Evolution of Form. And also you could, not, you could experience La Plaza without even having to step out of your car, but by coming by Main Street and enjoying Patrick Martinez's neon art installation, only light can do that. And then starting in July, we start our public programming outdoors with some salsa concerts, documentaries, screenings, uh, later on, even Selena will be showing Selena in August. So with that, again, this is a special one. Every other month we have with us the Mexican American Cultural Foundation, the nonprofit foundation with the mission of educating the community about the rich cultural contributions of the Mexican American community to this country, which are often uh, unrecognized. And to spotlight the many wildly successful Mexican immigrants, Mexican Americans and Chicanos and recruit their help as role models, we, they have created this video library of Mexican American history makers, which we'll be presenting today, one of those few chosen. So these are uh, sessions originated at La Plaza a couple of years back, but since the lockdown, we've been hosting them here at En Casa con La Plaza. Just to name a few of the distinguished guests, we've had Armando Duron, Dan Guerrero, Gloria Molina, Professor Gary Segura, and Nancy de los Santos. Our host, Jose Luis Ruiz, who is the president of the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation, uh, attended univers the university at UNAM. Uh, he came to the US as a young man. Now he's a nationally recognized professor, researcher, cosmetic dentist, Amazon bestseller, and award-winning Mexican American novelist. Enough about Dr. Ruiz, let him shine. Come on up, Dr. Ruiz. You could unmute, please. That's right, what a pleasure. Thank you for the introduction. And uh, yes, uh, we are the Mexican American Culture Education Foundation. And uh, why Mexican American? You know, a lot of people always ask me, why Mexican American, why not Latino? You know, and um, well, there's a number of reasons. And uh, uh, one of them is, I don't have to tell you, but for 180 years, uh, Mexican has been used as an offensive term. You know, several of our previous history makers like uh, Luis Valdez, uh, um, Ambassador Julian Nava, Alex Nogales, and others have reminded us that not that many years ago, you would be walking around in California and there would be signs that would say, no Mexicans, no Blacks, no dogs allowed. Uh, Alex Nogales specifically said, uh, 
how do you feel how do you think a young person would feel when they see that how does that do to their self esteem and you know self esteem is everything if you're not in psychology it's everything if you don't have self esteem it's very difficult to be successful um definitely we we uh, understand that this our false information this has been that what has been said about the Mexican American community is distorted. And that's the mission of the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation to make us realize that this is uh, false because in fact, Mexican Americans are uh, come from a illustrious culture with for 2000 years, Mexico was the center of, of culture in the continent. And uh, after the Spaniards arrived, Mexico was the center of the, 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 the most valuable colony. And even today, let's, let's not forget that our cousins in Mexico still is the, fifth, the 15th largest economy in the world. And that is not because we are uncultured or uneducated or not brilliant. The, the mission of the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation is to remind us of all the amazing contributions the Mexican Americans have given to this country, you know, and, and of course, you know, we today we have a, a person that has contributed to this country in endless ways, you know, one who is a true Mexican American history maker. We uh, were honored. To, to do that, we're honored to remind us that in order to, to do massive change, you know, to change our reputation and to change our image, we at the, the board of the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation have decided to, to promote filmmakers. And we have uh, uh, started a grant, a three three $10,000 grants uh, for filmmakers who are ready to make beautiful stories. Of course, we know that that amount is only seed money. It's only an effort to help those young people. They have great stories to tell that is going to change our image. You know, we want to give them a little push forward. So uh, we, we already have 70 applications and unfortunately we only have three grants. But also with the help of Moctezuma Esparza, we have uh, created a partnership with UCLA and the American Film Institute and, uh, and for, for Mexican-American students, $120,000 every year will be distributed in scholarships because we believe that if we have highly educated filmmakers at the top schools, you know, things will change. We will have more decision makers that will help us to tell our stories. Of course, we also invite you to, in 2022, at our Mexican American Film Festival and television, and, uh, and we, we, in which we want to honor Mexican American filmmakers who are telling beautiful stories and are helping us change this narrative. Before we start that, before we go into our main event, we have a special guest. And that is Terry Lopez. Terry Lopez is director of the Writers Guild of America, Inclusion and Equity Department. Terry works with producers, studio networks, executives, writers uh, to advance diversity representation. Terry received her Bachelor of Arts and Telecommunication and Film from California State University in Los Angeles and received the Outstanding Alumna of the Year Award. She's worked with great producers like Moctezuma Esparza, Robert Katz, working in different aspects of production, as well as working with several organizations, including being the founding member of LANIF's Diversity, Diverse Women in Media Initiative. Tonight, Terry is going to share with us information about the recently published Writers Guild of America Inclusion and Equity Report and what we can learn from it. Terry, please teach us a little bit about this. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank Jose Luis Ruiz of the Mexican American Cultural Education Foundation 
for inviting me to speak to you this evening. It's a true honor to be included amongst the many established individuals who have shared their pearls of wisdom. And I hope that I'm gonna be able to do the same um, and that you'll be able to learn a lot about my story and the work that I'm doing. Um, I am second generation Mexican-American on my mother's side. And my father who was born here comes from a long line of Tejanos from El Paso. And I see a lot of people in the chat from Texas. So hello Tejanos out there. I, I grew up with the Tejano pride. It's real, it exists and um, so welcome. Uh, I wanna start off with just saying, you know, my pearl of wisdom, I was thinking about this when I was invited, would be perseverance and upholding your dreams. Um, you know, continuing on a path in the face of difficulty where there may seem to be little or no hope of success. And that to me was my dream of working in the entertainment, entertainment industry. Um, you know, I, I didn't really feel at a young age that this was a industry that was for me. And the reason I felt that way was because, you know, I, I took a real interest in looking at TV and film credits. And I really noticed early on that those credits, there was very few female first names and even more so Latino last names. And being a woman that was Mexican American, I thought there's, this is not an industry for me. Um, so I sort of had this dream, but didn't really want to give up on it, but what I was seeing in, you know, on this, on the television screen and film screens sort of told me that this wasn't for me. And there's a lot of tie-ins to tonight. You know, I'm really happy to be here tonight um, to speak before Eddie as a history maker, because for me, Eddie was one of the first person that shared his pearl of wisdom. Uh, and I don't know if Eddie recalls this, but I grew up in Montebello and I went to Montebello Intermediate. And I remember one day being told we were gonna go into the, you know, the auditorium and we were gonna have an assembly and we were gonna hear from someone from our community who was gonna speak to us about his journey. And that was Eddie, that was Eddie almost. And I remember hearing him speak and seeing him and, you know, finding a commonality with him, someone that looked like me and he had made it in Hollywood. And that was very inspirational. And at a time when I was realizing that maybe this wasn't the industry for me, Eddie came into my life unexpectedly at this talk and gave me, you know, like hope. So later on time goes by and I go to see the movie Selena. I didn't know who Selena was, she was all over the news at the time. She had passed away. Um, and I didn't even know who she was because I didn't grow up listening to Tejano music, ironically, being that my father was from Texas. So when the movie came out, I wanted to go see this movie because it spoke to me. This was a woman, a Latina woman, Mexican-American, who had followed a dream. And I remember sitting there after the movie ended and reading those credits and just being in awe of so many Latino last names on that screen, you know, from the actors to the writers. And when it said executive produced by Moctezuma Esparza, I was thrown back. I was like, wow, that is such an indigenous sounding name. If Moctezuma can do this, it gives me hope that I can do this. And my journey continued on. Um, I came from a family that was middle class. I had nobody in my family that worked in entertainment. So I did not know how I was gonna get into entertainment. And I found ways. There was not a door for me that was there to open and walk through. So I created the door. I, I remember being at home one day watching a cable local access channel and they were asking for people to come out and just participate. I went there, I ended up coming up with an idea for a TV show where I was profiling rock and Espanol artists from all over Latin America. I didn't speak one word of Spanish because my parents brought us up speaking English. They wanted us to, you know, really assimilate and they didn't do, know they were doing a disservice to, for me and my brothers and sisters. So I created the show and I produced 13 episodes of the show. 
And I finally felt like I have a resume that I could put together that I produced this television show. And during that time, I attended this expo at the LA Convention Center and I got a goodie bag. And when I got home, I opened up that goodie bag and there was a issue of Latin Heat magazine. I didn't even know what Latin Heat was. I opened it up and they, they listed two Latino owned production companies. And one of them was El Norte Productions, Gregory Navas Production Company, and the other was Esparza Cats. I sent my resumes off to both, faxed them. Back then, faxes were the thing. And I got a call from Esparza Cats, and they asked me if I would come in and intern for them. I was working a full-time job at the time, and I, I would intern twice a week at Esparza Cats. And little did I know that Esparza Cats was the partnership of Moctezuma Esparza, that name on the screen that inspired me that day, and his partner, Robert Katz. Um, I interned there, the job ended up becoming, I mean, the internship became a job, and I got my first movie credit as the assistant to Moctezuma Esparza and Robert Katz on their film, Price of Glory. And I realized early on that Moctezuma and his partner were doing something that I, hadn't even realized existed and though that was they were championing stories from underrepresented communities they had you know, Terry Terry your story is amazing and the, of course uh Moctezuma is such a you know somebody that we're so proud of as well you know he's part of our organization um due to the fact that the, the limited in time would you give us a little bit of a I'll speed up of yeah. that, uh, Cool. Yeah, Thank no, you. I just wanted to say that being there with Mokta sort of led me to where I'm at now at the Writers Guild, because I didn't know that there were stories that wanted to be told out there from our community. And I met so many writers being there. Um, and fast forward, you know, I, I ended up at the Writers Guild advocating for underrepresented writers and having, you know, making sure that they were being considered for hiring from their own members, because their own members are showrunners and show creators that um, you know, are, are responsible for a lot of the shows that we see. So going, you know, as um, Jose Luis mentioned in the beginning, you know, the Writers Guild is 20,000 members plus currently. Um, we, because we are a union, we cannot mandate that our writers and our members self-identify, but those who have self-identified as Latino out of those 12,000, are 703. So you can see that percentage is very low. Out of those 703 identified Latinos, 226 identify as Mexican American. So the, we have a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and you know, the reason I, I wanted to share my story in the beginning is because I feel like there are a lot of people like me that want to do something and contribute to entertainment, but see this door is not being there. And sometimes we have to create that door, um, no matter how hard it might be. I feel that moving forward, you know, I've been at the Guild now 14 years. And I could say when I got there 14 years ago, the landscape was, as we would expect, white, male, straight men and they are the majority of our industry. Now, 14 years later, I, I have seen the change at the Guild and that, can, that also includes their board of directors. You know, the board of directors, when I got there was white, male, straight, able-bodied men. This is the first time we have gender parity on our board. And, you know, there's, this is the first time we've seen um, writers of color as being on our board. So as we see more of that happening at the, at the Guild and at other Guilds, we're gonna see more advocacy coming and more um, you know, people just really wanting to support getting the writers of color out there. Um, and that is what me and my, my staff do on a daily basis. We make sure that you know, a lot of Hollywood is controlled by those people of powers. It's controlled by the agencies. We just went through an agency negotiation where we asked all our members to let go of their agents. Um, and we had to do something in order to get them, you know, considered for work. So we built a system called Find a Writer, where writers can go in there and self-identify um, 
with a disability, with ethnicity, with languages, a way for they can be a way for them to be found. And we are now going around to all of the studios and letting them know this is how you can find writers. Um, you know, specifically to, to Latin American writers right now with shows like Vida and Hentified, we're, we're seeing more of a peak of interest from executives saying, I need to find Latin writers, but I don't know where to find them. Now we created this portal where they can find them. Um, our, you know, we're being really, even just internally, our members are becoming proactive. They've, you know, they have put together a list of writers. There's La Lista, which is a list of Latina writers um, and with all their credits. And they share these lists um, amongst other writers themselves, agents and executives. So now there's really no excuse for an executive to say, I do not know where to find Latino writers. We have created that space for them. The members themselves have, cre have created that space. And I think with writers like Tanya Serracho from Vida and Linda Yvette Chavez from Hentified and Mark Valadez of Queen of the South, Moises Zamora from the Selena series, they are now in the position of power to hire their staffs. And they are going to do what white men have been doing all their lives is hiring those that they know, those that can tell those stories and speak to the authenticity of those characters. So that is what we are doing at the Guild. We are working with our members. They are also becoming activated and they really want to take charge in this. And anybody who is interested in learning more, I will give, I'll put my email in the chat or you just have questions for me specifically. I'd love to hear from you because I know when I was coming up, just having that person to ask questions to meant a lot. And a lot of people did that for me. So I'd love to give back and do that in the same way. Um, but that is where we're, where we are at, at the Writers Guild of America right now. And some of you, the people you mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Jose Luis, Dan Nancy de los Santos was a board member early on. Um, so it's really great to see the connection leading back to this organization. Wow, what, what a great job you are doing, Terry. We're, we're, we're very thankful for all of your, your work that you're doing at the Writers Guild. And, and of course, uh, what a wonderful opportunity for some of the young people that are tuning in now. And we'll be tuning later because we know that usually we'll have a few thousand viewerships later. So they, when you say you're going to put your email there, that, you, you know, you're the, um, very, very kind of you. And, and, uh, and definitely this, you know, it, it will help a lot of people, I'm sure. And this is, we're thankful, very thankful. And thank you for being here. And, and uh, I'm sure there will be questions later after, after our, our very special interview that we have in store for you, my friends. We, we have come to that moment in which we will learn, you know, so much from one true Mexican-American history maker. Um, we, we all know Edward James Olmos, we, you know, but I still want to give you a very short uh, introduction because if I read all his accolades, we're gonna be sitting here for half an hour and we don't wanna do that. So uh, Mr. Olmos has achieved extraordinary success as an actor, producer, and humanitarian. The Tony, Emmy, and Academy Award nominate, nominated actor is probably best known to young audiences for his work in the television series Battlestar Galactica as Admiral William Adama. Although the series kept uh, Mr. Almost busy, he, he made the time to direct the HBO movie Walkout in 2007, for which he earned the DGA nomination uh, in the Outstanding Directorial Achievements in Movie for Television category. Uh, Mr. Almost, you know, was originally a musician who then move into acting, appearing in many small theater productions until portraying the iconic El Pachuco in Suit Suit. Uh, Mr. Olmos went to appear in endless uh, high quality movies. And of course, many of us remember him in Miami Vice of hosting Don Johnson and filling Michael Thomas, you know, one of the most popular show at the time where, where he earned 
two Golden Globes and Emmy Award nomination resulting in a win and a win of each. In 1988, he was nominated for the Academy Award and won the Golden Globe for his portrayal of James Escalante in Stand and Deliver. Who can forget that movie? He directed and starred in his first motion picture, American Me, in 1992. Let's not forget that Mr. Olmos is also um, an international advocate, exposed, uh, spokes, a spokesman, humanitarian, work, working with many organizations such as Thank You Ocean, Project Hope Foundation, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, the Boys and Girls Club of America, and many, many others. So, Mr. Olmos, uh, what a pleasure, what a great pleasure. I know that you uh, grew up in East LA, and uh, East LA was one of those um, one of those neighborhoods where so many great people have been born. And and you know, I've heard that that uh, it was very diverse at one point. Tell us a little bit about your your experience growing in East LA. First of all, thank you, Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz, and to Abelardo de la Peña Jr., and to Terry especially. Terry is a, a real asset to all that we stand for, as you are. And uh, I must say thank you to everyone that's listening and uh, took the time to lock in and say hi and, and listen to uh, the stories that we're telling. Terry's story was profound. It's exactly the truth, a truth that... Uh, works it really works she was so right on when she says you know we had to make the door there were no doors to get in there was no when i started in 1964 i went to east l.a community college i i, I was born and raised in, in east l.a on the corner of first in indiana right there on cheeseboro lane which is between indiana and lorena off of first street and uh the year was 1947 that I was born in the first Japanese hospital after the war. And uh, my doctor was Dr. Ichioka, a Japanese doctor. And uh, I came into this world uh, pretty much in the most diverse way possible. I mean, I got to tell you, uh, at my home, I remember so well, um, it was like right next door to us lived a family of, uh, of about uh, Martinez's. There was about 13 kids. Uh, that was to the left of us as I walked out the door. To the right, the perfect house was a, uh, an indigenous family. And uh, they had uh, two kids. And then right across the street, um, there was uh, a Japanese family. And, uh, and then uh, if you make a left going up to First Street, right out, as you, the street would end right there on First Street, but there was a driveway that on the other side of the street that went up the hill and there was two houses. One house on the left, they shared the same driveway. One house on the left had around six children and they were Russian Orthodox and they would dress in their formal Orthodox clothing every day. And they wore, the women wore their hats, a white kind of hat. It wasn't a hat, it was a, a, like a turban. And then uh, the, the men wore their, their Cossack uh, shirts, you know, white, everything was white. And they were like, they were, they were albino. So they were white, white, and the kids were the same way. Right in the other house across from them was an African-American family. And they had like six or seven kids too. And, but they were blue black, they were so dark. So like when I, I you know, when I was two, three, four years old, these kids used to come in for my birthday parties. And, uh, and so there was Japanese, there was indigenous, there was Latinos, there was, uh, you know, Europeans, <laughs> there was, uh, you know, Africans, there was incredible diversity. And I thought being a child, you know, that's the way life was and just diverse all the way. And in the mornings that we'd go to school, they walk us over to Belvedere Elementary and uh, for preschool and, and, and uh, for second grade. Uh, and, on, and on the corner of First and Indiana, 
for, uh, even on cheaper lane, there would be, uh, we'd get up, you know, we'd start walking, see around 7, 7.15, get there by 8 o'clock. And we'd walk down First Street to, to Gage, where, where Belvedere Elementary was. And we'd pass the uh, Jehovah Witnesses, who were Even all dressed up. Diversity. Yeah, he, oh, wait, Dr. Jose Luis, this is my life. I'm telling <laughs> you my life. I, I walk by them and they're very cordial, very nice. They're always dressed with a shirt and a tie and slacks and all clean cut. And there was African Jehovah Witnesses. There was Caucasian, there was Latino. And they would stand there giving you the watchtower. That was oh. their magazine. And then we'd go past them. They'd hand us the watch on my grandpa. My great grandfather would take it and we'd keep on walking. And then at least once or twice a month, We'd get a knock on the door. Uh, the Mormons would come to ask us if anybody had passed away. Wow! You know, because they they need to put them in the scrolls. They they they, they document everyone that was born and died. And so, and we would talk to them, and they would come. Always very nice, very congenial. Um, we were. I was raised American Baptist. Okay, my great grandfather was a custodial person of the church he would take wow. care of the church and uh so we'd go there and and we'd go early in the morning uh to open the church at seven in the morning we'd go and open the church and then um the people start arriving around 8 15 8 30 we would i'd have my grandfather great grandfather papa grande uh, we would have he would have we would help him raise the seats so all the seats were lined up and Put all the books and all the missiles and all the uh, uh, fire books, uh, song books, and 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 then they open. And then I don't know if you've ever been to a Baptist church, but it's fire and brimstone. Okay? Well, it's real, real fire and brimstone. They, they, <laughs> the preacher, the preacher, speaks really strong about life and gives you wisdom and 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 scares you. They scare you. So they used to have to get the kids out of the room before they started getting real deep into their their wisdom and philosophy and, and, and their teachings. And, and but fire and brimstone in Spanish is way more intense than in English. <laughs> yeah, language, you know, the language is so beautiful. It was really, Spanish it's a beautiful, so beautiful, beautiful language. And um, and like, um, it's really interesting when listening to Terry uh, uh, in the movie that I made, uh, Walkout, uh, with uh, uh, Moctezuma Esparza. I've been working with Moctezuma Esparza since about 1981. Actually, 1979, 1980, we both were up with uh, Robert Redford and we created Sundance Institute oh. with Bob. We were, we were the original pioneers of, of that organization. And, uh, very, it was beautiful. Very impressive. And very beautiful. Um, uh well, so you you grew up in all this this uh, um, you know cultures uh, as equals as, as kids are as we we don't see the difference. We're just kids, and we see different kids, but we're all the same. Uh, when do you see any difference? When do you when you know? I know your parents are originally, you know, or I believe your father is from Mexico, yeah. and um, when do you start? You know. Uh, simulating your 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 culture and and, and there, maybe... there used to be we used to have a red car dr Ruiz. we used to, the red car was the train the electric train that ran and it would that the it would it was all over uh los angeles you could go from uh all the way from uh, whittier all the way to ventura on the train you could go from pasadena and further out to Pasadena, all the way to the beach, Long wow. Beach or Santa Monica or wherever. This, the, the railing system was the best rail, uh, electric railing system in the world. It was beautiful. We didn't need, no one was driving cars yet. They, they, wow. they had them, but it wasn't the common thing. The, until the uh, car dealers and the, and the tire companies and the oil companies bought the train system and dismantled it. Wow. So they put Green. and they, they oh boy, they 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 took out all of the the train tracks, and they then and they put us into cars. <laughs> Everybody had to have a car now, 
And so, uh, but before, so the first time I ever went over the first street bridge into downtown Los Angeles, I started to notice that in my community, there was, it was a salad of the, where the, 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 you know, like you had the lettuce, you had tomato, you had the onion, you had the olives, you had the Italian, you had the Italian or French dressing that you put on cross and stuff. And it was tossed. The salad was tossed. So I knew, you know, there was Jewish people there. There was Jehovah witnesses. There were Mormons. There was Baptists. There were Catholics. There was Methodists. There was Protestants. That churches everywhere, little groupings and stuff. And, and, but as soon as I went over the bridge with my great grandfather and my, my mom and everybody on the train, I started to see that on one section, all I saw was African American. And we go a little bit further and I went to another and I saw that the was nothing but tomato all together. And then go a little further and it was like the onions were in this other section, but there was no olives where the onions were. And there was no, mm. there was no tomatoes with the onions or, or with the uh, uh, olives and, and, and every, every grouping that I, that I saw in my neighborhood, East LA, were all separate as I got across and started driving, I'm riding the train all the way to, to uh, Santa Monica, the Santa Monica Pier. Used to take hours to get there. What a and it was wonderful, a wonderful journey. Ah. As, as a kid on the train, it was just, it was beautiful. It was so informative, it was so, it was just like every time you got on the train, it was like explosive. It was wonderful. You just ride along on the train. You're looking out the window and you see life go by you and things you'd never seen before. And it was beautiful. And but I noticed that the salad in past the first street on the first street, passing the L.A. River, just <laughs> crossing over the L.A. River. It ended. It, <laughs> it ended. There was, the, the salad wasn't tossed. But you see, it was there, a, but it wasn't time. Exactly. Such a beautiful childhood. It sounds like it, it sounds like ideal, ideal, like the way it should be, the way we should live. Um, you you had tremendous self-esteem because you wanted to be a, a baseball player and a singer. What gave you so much self-esteem, so much confidence? You know, I want <laughs> they got a picture of me singing rock and roll. That's, that's right. when I was, I was sing, That's when I was singing at Gazari's on the Sunset Strip. I stayed there from 1960 to nine, 64 to 1968. Four years, uh, seven days a week, I performed uh, on that stage with different groups. We we sang with uh, God Ike and Tina Turner. We sang with uh, uh, Redbone, and uh, all kinds of great groups came through there. The Doors were there for. Uh, I think they stayed around six or seven months on that stage. And then Pat and Lolly Vegas, who became Red Bull, they stayed on that stage for at least nine months. And then when I came on that stage, Pat said to me, Pat Vegas said to me, you've got to do at least nine months here, okay? I said, okay. Well, I stayed four years on that stage singing rock and roll. And, and I came out of baseball. You said, you talked about it first. Baseball was the where I learned something that Terry was talking about. Um, I learned four major, major things that really got me to where I am today. I really, and to this day, I still understand and bring about a strong feeling of, of thankfulness and gratefulness for understanding. That's, I had determination. When I started playing baseball, I couldn't play. I couldn't catch the ball. I couldn't do anything. But I had an incredible amount of, of determination to catch the ball. And so I went from, you know, not being able to catch the ball to by the time I was 13 or 14 years old, I was playing in the, in the uh, Winter League with, uh, at the California Sun League, which was guys with like Bobby Knopp, Gary Knopp, um, uh, got George Pena, um, the list goes on. I was catching, wow. I was a catcher, second baseman and catcher at that time. And uh, I was 13 years old, 14. I was a little kid. I wasn't big, you know, but I was, I, I would catch like Eddie Roebuck. 
during the off season, he and Sandy Koufax were the greatest pitchers at that time that were pitching for the Dodgers. And, um, but I, I went from not knowing how to catch a ball at the age of five to playing every day. So I disciplined myself to do the things I love to do when I didn't feel like doing them. And that became a key to that door that's not there. Well, that key has brought me to today, sitting here with you and you asking me this question and all the people that are listening right now can understand that this is a reality, a truth. You can listen to it and you can learn it, think about it, do whatever you want. But this is what's great about what you do, Dr. Ruiz, by exposing everyone to, in this manner, Mexican-American culture. Because I am a true Mexican-American. I'm Chicano all the way, okay? I've never stopped being a Chicano ever. So I, I was born and I was, to this day, I'm 74 going on 75. I know I look good, but I'm old. You look amazing. <laughs> I'm old. And, and so anyway, I saw baseball up at the age of 14. And then I was playing really, really well. I was uh, batting over close to 500. Um, I, was, uh, I won the California State Batting Championship two years in a row uh, uh, when I was 13 and 14. And, uh, and I was being groomed by the Dodgers to play professional ball. That's why they had me at the California League playing with Bobby Knopp, who went on to be the manager or the coach of the Angels, and uh, Gary, his brother, who was a brilliant third baseman, and, uh, and George Pena and all these kids that played great baseball. They were really, really good professional ball players when they were 14, 15, 16, 17. You know, I was like four years, three to four years younger than them at the time. And so uh, baseball led me into understanding discipline. Then from that, because I played it every day, seven days a week, I learned determination. Okay. I learned perseverance, which is what Terry was talking about. Perseverance is really, really essential to making you understand your full potential, okay? And then the key to the whole thing was patience. You had to put in the time and be patient with yourself because I wasn't trying to be the best baseball player in the world. I wasn't. I wasn't trying to be the best actor in the world, Dr. Reese. I wasn't trying to be the best singer in the world. I was just trying to be the best that I could be, which is really the key to living your life to the fullest. And that's exactly what I did. I ended up discipline, determination, perseverance, and patience became the key to why I sit here today with all the accolades that I've received, being able to do the movies that I've been able to make, and, and Terry saying the doors were locked. Hey, in 1964, when I took my first acting class at East LA Community College, there was no doors, there was no craft. I mean, there was Anthony Quinn, there was Rita Moreno, there was uh, Jose, uh, Jose Ferreira, um, there was um, uh, Ricardo Montalban, uh, there was, uh, you know, uh, Rita Hayworth, who was Latina, but she didn't go by her Latina name. Uh, there were, but then none of them, none of them, had created anything to do with their culture. Wow. None of them. They, they performed, they were great actors, they were great performers, and they would do, you know, they were working for the studios and the studios had them on the contract. And uh, when I came in the contracts, there was no more contracts in the mid 64, 65, when I started acting, you know, I was a singer first, remember? And I was, yeah. I was singing, a baseball I player to singer. How do you jump from singer to actor? What, what that was easy. That, that, that was that was easy, easy. You know, when you're sitting here right now, and I, if I say to you, uh, you know, hey everybody, how are you? Hey, you feeling good? Yeah, ooh, yeah. And then you, that's singing, right? Okay. okay. Well, it's easier to do as a performer. Hey, everybody, how are you doing? Everybody feeling good? Good. Oh, yeah. Now, 
So singing, I went in from singing and I encompassed the world of, of theater mm. because singing is storytelling. Yeah. Singing is a storyteller. You're doing a story in about two to three minutes. Exactly. Okay, some, some people sing a seven minute song. That's wow, that's storytelling seven minutes. Wow. And but no, most songs are like two minutes, two and a half minutes long, three minutes. And so uh, I was I was a storyteller. At the age of 14, I became a storyteller. And, and, and I became a performer of the stories. Everything I would be singing, I would feel it. And I would, if it was a sad song, I'd be crying. If it was a happy song, I'd be laughing. I felt the moment. And I wasn't performing for the people. I was performing the story for, as a storyteller. And, and if you appreciate it, a lot of people hated my singing. I didn't blame them. I couldn't carry a tune. I couldn't carry a note. I was, I was, I was really, I was flat. I was always flat. So but, the, being, but you were being, a great performer. We could see oh, it on, on that photo. We saw that on that photo <laughs> where you were believe like, really me, I was, I was in it, Dr. Reese. I mean, people <laughs> came from all over the place, all over California. Because I was on the Sunset Strip, I was at Gazari's. Right next to me was Love, and they were playing at the at the Galaxy. And next door to them was Jimi Hendrix and 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 uh, uh, you know Eric Clapton and Otis Redding and all these. So all the three nightclubs were right next to each other, and so we'd be in one of them. Uh, uh, you know, the Galaxy had different. They had uh, Chicago. They had Love, the group Love back in the '60s now, and uh, they had the Birds. They, you know, uh, Bob Dylan would play down at the uh, at the Sea Witch, and uh, and the Troubadour was down two blocks down on Melrose. We were on Sunset. They were then Santa Monica and then Melrose, and uh, no, excuse me, they were on Santa Monica. They're one block down, Santa Monica and Dovini, and uh, so the Troubadour had, you know, Leon Russell. They had uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, God, he came out there. Uh, um, oh, the, everybody was on the strip. It was the greatest time in the world to be uh, in in California and be a rock and roller. Be a rock star. It was great. It was just great. Jimmy Morrison of the Doors would come in and watch us perform, and he he appreciated our work. We'd go out after we were done singing, and so. But music, wow. music, and theater are are hand in hand. They're storytelling. That's saying the words is easier than singing the words mm -hmm. okay now what a beautiful, what a, what a beautiful uh, uh story and i remember watching suit suit and you your performance in that in that movie was just amazing do you the think point. that do you think it is there's any connection between music and suit suit of course i mean basically i had been preparing to do that role for 14 years. When I stepped on the theater stage when I was at East LA Community College when I was 17 years old, you know, I jumped up on that stage and, and started acting. And at the same time, I was still singing. I was singing at, at uh, in the Sunset Strip. I would work wow. every night, every night, 7.30 to 2 o'clock in the morning, we perform. Half hour on, half hour off. And- uh, Talking about discipline. That. Well, discipline, determination, perseverance, and patience is a key. Yeah. Being able to make yourself honestly do something you love to do when you don't feel like doing it exactly. is the key to making you the best that you can be, not better than anybody else. I never thought about that. I never thought about being rich or famous. That was, that was not the ingredients that drove me. My intention was to be a storyteller and really a learn from the experience of telling stories uh, whether it be singing or whether it be speaking them and and, and what ended up happening oh. i did it for so many years mm -hmm. straight that when i got on the stage to do el pachuco forget it it was all over i mean i th that was singing dancing it was comedy it was drama it was style it was everything and, and it was live place. theater and that that play was truly a gift, a gift to the community. It was, yeah. All yeah. black, Reed white, brown, yellows, and reds loved that play. Yeah. They came to see it. It wasn't only Latinos that came to see it. Everybody came to see it. 
They came from all over the world to see that play. They came from Russia. They came from England. They came from uh, 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 India. They came from yeah. Japan. I mean, major theater groups came from all over the world at different times during the performances that were given. And because they had heard about this performance, yeah. this performance, yeah. the El Pachuco, the performance live on stage was so memorable. People to this day uh, will cannot forget their feeling of what they felt like the very first time they saw El Pachuco take the stage. Yeah. And I, I thank Jose, uh, I, th I thank Luis, uh, you know, Luis Valdez for, and his brother, Danny, for creating a truly exquisite piece of theater and storytelling. Such a piece of art, right? Un unbelievable. And you, you know, you have, you have made, you have done so many great uh, movies, uh, such, you know, of course, I mean, I grew up in the time of Miami Vice and I, I was in awe of your, when, you know, every time that you were on screen, it was, you know, your, your coolness and your voice. I mean, it was, it was the centering of, of that show. And, uh, and of course, stand and deliver, who can, uh, I mean, if we could spend all night talking about so many of those spectacular performances that you have given the, the, the world of acting. And um, I have to say, and of course it's a personal belief, but your, your, your artistic <clears throat> skills are, 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 you know, as, as good or better than some of the greatest you know, performances, Sir, 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 all, uh, um, Sir Olivier and all these people, would you say that, that because of being a Mexican-American actor, Latino, maybe you were not given as, uh, the opportunity to become the most respected actor in the world? Because I think you deserve to be. Um, Dr. Reese, the, the truth of it is that it comes in, uh, you, you know it very well, discrimination and prejudices are an, an essential and integral part of humanity. Okay, discrimination, prejudices, okay. Um, I don't use the word racism, okay. I don't use the word race to say, you know, uh, to me, race is a unifying word. To me, there's only one race, and that's the human race. And inside of the human race, there are African cultures, there are Asian cultures, indigenous cultures, Caucasian cultures, Latino cultures, but there's only one race, the human race. So when somebody says to me, that's racial discrimination, I say, well, when a bug doesn't like you, that's racial discrimination. The bug doesn't like humanity, okay. But when a person doesn't like another person because of the color of their skin or the way that the religion or what politics or whatever it is, that's just plain discrimination or prejudices. But keep the word race. Race is a unifying word. We turned it into a, a divisive word back in like 1471, the French did, because they wanted to be able to make the other, that we needed the other, because how could you know, you couldn't kill your own race. So you had to make it the other. So the Africans were the other, the Asians were the other, the Latino was the other, you know? And, and, and to me, uh, I understand it, I understand it. But I really wish that we would unite. Nothing unites us in this world today. The only thing that does unite us usually is fear. And how that unites us is by way of, like if there's an earthquake, everybody where that earthquake hits is united <laughs> you know, they, and in church yeah well church yeah you get united in church but churches religion has a big problem the day that the catholic calls the protestant to make sure that the jehovah witness is not late to the bar mitzvah that's the day i want to say okay now religion understands this place it's a unifying should be unifying but every religion that i've ever been around and i've been around a lot of religion in my life they always feel that they're the, the truest and best way to get to God and get to heaven, okay? And I say to that, well, I don't know. I think God and heaven are right here on earth. And for me, I think that God is in us. We are the light. 
We are the light. And if you let it shine, people grow from it. But if you think that the light is up there and that's where the light is and everybody's got to look up into the light, okay, then what are you? Are you a filter? Are you, what are you? If, if God is us and we are God, okay, not to say that we are gods, but to say that we have the strength and power of knowledge and wisdom, which gives us the ability to be the best that we can be. Now, I, I'm like anybody else. I have done great things and I've done stupid upon doing either one of the two I did them okay so that's me and all I can say to anybody is that to always try to give of yourself to others as you would want them to give of themselves to all you right. all right okay. it's it's a simple I mean it's it's in almost every bible the Tur Tur Quran has it, 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 it it's it's everywhere in all the religions, there's some formula of that understanding. Do unto others as you would like to have them do unto you. That being said, you know, as far as I'm concerned right now, we have a great opportunity of using the art form that Terry knows so well. Okay. This art form that I've become very well known in, okay, right. is, is an art form that's the strongest art form the world has ever created, human has ever created. Nothing is more attacks the subconscious mind more than exactly. the audio visual event exactly. nothing no book no live performance okay nothing no painting nothing and it's yet all of all, all of those things do attack the subconscious mind don't get me wrong you go and watch a great performance of of a, of, of a symphony orchestra you, you get your mind blown if you go to watch a great uh, dance ballet you get your mind blown but you really want to get your mind blown, sit down in a dark room with no peripheral vision, with Dolby stereo sound, with an 80 foot <laughs> screen in front of you and just sit there and let all the information come into you. Yeah. Then you'll see what really it, it's all about. Because you put yeah. a live performance or you, you photograph that live performance and you put on a big screen, it becomes so much more intense. And, and, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, you have, you started the youth cinema project, which um, because, you know, because of it, thousands and thousands of young people have uh, start falling in love and in, in, uh, falling in love with, with this beautiful art form that you are so well known for. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. I mean, it is, I don't think enough people know. I mean, everybody knows about your beautiful art, but not enough people know about how, what a great humanitarian and an activist you are. You've, you've done so much for the community. This is one of those projects that, that, that blows my mind. Tell us a little bit about the Youth Cinema Project. It was something that developed. It was a process that developed. We created out of a necessity the Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival, a film festival that personified and brought into the United States, especially Los Angeles, great films from all over Latin America, Ibero-America, all over, from Central America, Mexico, South America, from the Caribbean, from Spain, Portugal, anywhere Latinos were understood, we, we, we brought the films that they were creating. We found German Latinos. We found Russian Latinos. We found Japanese Latinos. Wow. Okay. Uh, that, that were, you know, Peruvian Japanese that were Peruvian. Okay. Their kids, everybody. And they, they were doing great, great, great artwork, great art. And so we'd find them and bring them here and we'd show them. Well, um, it was Marlene Dermer. George Fernandez, may he rest in peace, Kirk Whistler and myself, the four of us got together to create the Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival in my living room. And this was in 1997 going into 1998. 1998, we had the very first film festival. And in that film festival, from the very beginning, we'd bring children. We'd have movies for the kids. If they were grammar school kids, junior high kids, high school and college kids. Four different films would be shown. 
<coughs> and that's how the relationship between the film festival and children got involved. And then we started to have them come and, and on the Metro, anybody that was on the Metro along the line could get on the Metro for free. And the Metro had opened it up so that if you were at a school and you were a kid at school, you could get on the, you could bring your class, the whole class would come on the train. <laughs> and we were right there at the Highland and, and uh, uh, Hollywood complex and at the, for a long time at the Egyptian and at the uh, um, Grauman's Chinese and at the Al Capitan, we used those theaters. And so that being said, we, we would bring the kids in there and they would watch movies and the teachers would say, you know something, I, I can't believe it. I can't make my children read for two hours. But yet you bring them in here, you show them a, a movie in Spanish and they sit here and they'll read the subtitles for two hours. <laughs> and they were just stunned by that. And of course, the kids that spoke Spanish read the subtitles because they want to make sure that the subtitles were correct. <laughs> And the kids that didn't know Spanish would hear it in Spanish and then read the subtitles and start to relate to the two languages and how they would work. Well, from reading and performing and showing in there, we developed by 2003, a program where we go into the school, a school in a classroom and teach kids how to make film. 2003. Jessica Love and, 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 and Polo, to I mean, kids I've, I've seen it. I've seen the I've seen the videos of those kids carrying the camera and performing and dressing and you know uh, all this this young Latino mostly kids I mean it's, it's spectacular it's such a wonderful thing that you're doing I'm you know we, the reason we should all be so proud of you I'm telling you right now the reason why it works so well and 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 Stanford University. Uh, who has the finest assessment program, doctoral assessment program in the world, uh, came to, to study us. Three doctors came down to study oh, really? the program for a year and they wrote assess an assessment on it. And wow. they said that it was way beyond our understanding. Yeah. We had created something that we didn't even know how impactful it was. Oh, yeah. we, 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 the guys who created, didn't realize how incredible it was because what happened is that we learned that we go into the fourth grade and we teach fourth graders on up from fourth grade all the way through high school. We, start, we, started, we started in the fourth grade and we learned that by teaching children how to make film. And I mean, really, I bring in two mentors to every classroom, mm -hmm. okay? We go twice a week from the very first week of school all the way to the very end of the school. It's not an after school special. It's not done in, in the library or done in a little room after school or no, it's done in the classroom that they study English, that they study biology, math, history. It's, it's in that same classroom. We change for 90 minutes, twice a week, we change the construct of that classroom. Yeah. And when the American Film Institute, which is the number one institute, film institute in the world, came to see the program, they wept. The, the, the program directors of the, of the American Film Institute wept because they really understood what the impact was on these children. And it was amazing to see a 10 year old, nine and 10 year olds, uh, they learn how to write stories, synopsises and treatments. They learn how to write the scripts. They learn how to storyboard. They learn how to uh, cast. They learn how to location scout. They learn how to run cameras. They learn how to run sound. They learn how to edit. They learn how to do pre-production, production, and post-production over a nine month period. And those kids, when they get done, their self-esteem, their self-respect, their self-worth is so high that it affects all their study. Dr. Reese, it, it, it affected their math. It affected their, their language. It affected their, their history, their oh. biology, their chemistry. Fourth graders that were, yeah. they had been matured in such a high way that now we're in 1400 kids took the class in 2020. Wow. Okay. In yeah. 13 school districts in California. Okay. 
<laughs> we have we we've just gotten three Keep more growing, for this year. Please. Yeah, in this school district, this school year, <coughs> we we just added three more three more districts, and wow. we added Texas, Midland, oh, really? Texas. Oh, yeah, wow. we're going to mid going to Midland. Wonderful. We're going to Dallas. Wonderful. We're going to San Antonio, and they all want it. They they took it. They, they, since we're bilingual, the country of Panama heard about it. And so we we now structured it and it's now in Panama. Okay. Wow. They wanted in they wanted in Arizona, they wanted in, in New Mexico, they wanted in Texas, they wanted it in Georgia, they wanted it in in Florida, they wanted it in New York, and they wanted yep. it in Toronto, Canada. Wow. And, I, and so it, it's grabbing hold. Our goal is not to create filmmakers, Dr. Reese. It's not about making filmmakers. It's to, it's to give them self-esteem. It's to give them, make the, we're trying to make them lifelong learners. That's right. Just I, I, I bet you try to give to them determination, discipline, patience. <laughs> <laughs> discipline, right? determination, perseverance, and patience. Yes, <laughs> we do. Very, very good. A, a, anyone that wants to know anything about the Youth yes, Cinema please Project, tell just, go, just go to YCP, youthcinemaproject.com, or go to La Leaf. L A L I F F Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival dot org, and you'll oh. go in there and you you'll see the you'll see the program you'll see you'll see the program from the it's it's the housing is Latino Film Institute, the yeah, Latino right. Film Institute houses uh, at the present time it houses um, two of my nonprofits which is La Leaf the Film Festival yeah. and the Youth Cinema Project. Yeah. But I also created why uh, uh, Latino public broadcasting. That's also a thing that I created back in 1998. Also, and that that brings about. What did you do on that one? Pardon? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, Latino public broadcasting is is truly a gift. Uh, it's I we take money that's given to us by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting (CPB), okay. mm -hmm. and they give us about a million three hundred thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And we give it to filmmakers, Latino filmmakers. Beautiful. And we Beautiful. we spread it out, and uh, we give you know anybody that wants to try to get some of this money, it's there. It's a million over a million dollars that is given to people every filmmakers every year, and we have been doing it since 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 uh, 1998. So right. Wow. It. And so we've we... done we've done millions and millions of dollars towards uh, making documentaries and feature length motion pictures and shorts and uh but they're all in, interrelated that along with the latino book and family festival which i created in, in 1998 also so i created the latino public broadcasting mm -hmm. uh, latino book and family festival mm -hmm. uh, uh, latino literacy now which which really brings about awareness of all the latino authors all of, from all over the world Right. And, and, and gives awards to the best of the best yes. so the people around the world will know what Latinos think about their cultural icons of, of, of authorship and uh, yep. Yep. some of the greatest promoting the culture world. in every aspect what a what a wonderful gift that you're giving our our um, our people you know I think we have learned I mean we my friend, you are a, a walking book. <laughs> you have so much knowledge and experience and obviously you're brilliant at everything that you've decided to do. And, and, um, and that's very, very impressive. And um, I have to say, uh, one of my last questions that I always last, like to ask is, what would you tell your, uh, uh, a 12 year old Edward James they wants to get into the acting, uh, uh, um, maybe want to, you know, become uh, an actor or producer or director. What would be the advice? And and I know you have those four words, and they are very powerful. <laughs> well, the, the the key is the key to any life, whether you want to be in the entertainment business or whether you want to be a, a scientist or whether you want to be a professor or maybe you want to be a, a, a athlete. Uh, it doesn't matter what you want to be as long as you have the passion 
for it. You have to have passion for it. And once you have passion for whatever it is that you really want to do, then you then you bring in discipline. Then you bring in perseverance, you know, and patience and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, determination. You know, those that's those then those ingredients are values that everybody is born with it. Right. Zero. <laughs> you have no patience, you have no determination, you have no perseverance, you have no none of that you learn those behaviors you learn it some of us are learning it right this second by hearing it you've known about it but now it re it's reinforced because listen dr reese i am not naturally gifted or naturally talented i am a I think, kid I, that I am a kid that. i am a kid that came from east los angeles okay in 1947 when discrimination and prejudices were running wild, the Japanese were in internment camps, and and it was the Mexicans did they would go off to war, and when they came home, they couldn't even rent a house. Okay, and, and it was it was really a tough time, and and out comes this little kid, you know, didn't know nothing, and then started to to play the game of baseball, couldn't play it learned and to discipline himself to do it every day every day every day people look at me and say how can you tell people to do something seven days a week come on you didn't do that seven i said believe me seven days a week i would take my dream out and i would polish it i would either read about it talk about it look at other people do it or do it myself but every single day Whatever I was doing, I mean, when I, if it was baseball, I was doing it in baseball. It, and that doesn't mean that I didn't do other things also. Right. That didn't mean that I wasn't doing, you know, work. Uh, I had to make my bed. I had to, you know, I had to do stuff that I didn't want to do. And that made me even stronger. By doing things right. you don't want to do, discipline yourself to do the things you don't want to do, you'll have the discipline to do the things you want to do when you don't feel like doing them. And that became like, wow, when I learned that key, I was a little kid. And all of a sudden I said, man, last week I couldn't do this. I'd throw the ball up in the air and I'd catch it. Or I'd, I'd throw it against the wall and it'd, it'd be dribbling down. And I'd go down and I'd pick it up off the ground as it was rolling back to me real fast. Because I'd be playing with a tennis ball. And, and, and so I said to myself, if after a month of doing that, man, I got to be really good at, at stopping the ball on the ground. And then when I went to finally play in organized baseball, I was really good. And I'd never played on a real team before. And, and but I, I had been practicing catching the ball and, and hitting it. And, and so I, I, I'd seen other people do it. And so I tried to do what they were doing. And so you, you need passion. Passion is the key. But then you have to have the discipline, the determination, the perseverance and the patience to right. give yourself the time to grow. And then remember why you're doing it. Why are you doing it? Are you doing it to get rich and famous? You lost. You lost. If that's your intention is to get known or become famous, I want to be, I want to be a star. You'll make it. You'll make it. Don't get me wrong. You'll make it if those are your ideals and your values. But you will self-destruct because the choices that you make will not be for the advancement of yourself and others. It'll be for the advancement of only you. Right. And that's okay. There's a lot of stars that are out there that are major stars that think that, they're, that their caca don't, don't stink. But it does. <laughs> it does. Everyone's does. Even Queen Elizabeth's that's Festa. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's in the process, all right? But I, I can tell you this. If I, when I talk to children, I talk to a lot of them. I've been doing that for 50 years. I've been I've been sharing my my experiences in my life with the community. That's I'm better known for that. Like Terry, Terry heard me speak, and, and you know she got a, a sense of understanding herself a little bit better after listening to me speak. So many of the people who are listening to this right now feel a lot better about themselves because they realize, hey, wait a minute. If you're 60 or 70 years old right now and you're listening to me say this, you can honestly, honestly. Be all that you can be at this moment, making the right decision in respects of chasing your passion and then disciplining yourself to do it when you don't feel like doing it. 
that makes you the best that you can be. Not better than anybody else. That's not the gift. The gift is not to be better than other people. It's to be the best that you can be, period. And that once you get that, Terry did that. And, you know, and I'm sure Abelardo did it too. I'm, and, you know, we all did. You did. You're a doctor, Dr. Reese. That's I love right. you. I, will, I love you. I gotta go eat. I will. I will <laughs> never forget those four words: discipline, determination, patience, and perseverance. I think we have all learned so much today. We we are very thankful, my friend, for for giving us some of your time. I, we know how valuable your time is. And you gave us a lot more time that, that, <laughs> than yeah, this. We, we were, were way so over. The, we went over the, so the line. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Abelardo, you, now I, I, I'm sure we run out of time for questions, but you, you yeah. guide us now, my friend. Thank you so much, uh, Edward. That was uh, fantastic. As, as usual, you bring a lot of uh, passion. Uh, we can't hear you, Abelardo, for some reason. Uh, let, me, let me take this off. Okay. Yeah, I think the little the, the battery is probably low. But um, Terry, thank you as well. Your your you you information and so okay. much. Oh uh, yeah, beautiful. So, such a beautiful story, and we are very thankful. We know you're doing so much. We 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 know what we're gonna hear a lot more from you in the future. Thank you, Terry. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, and just real quick, could you hear me now? Yes. Oh, yes. fantastic. Great. All uh -huh. right. Yeah, these, I think we went so long, my earbuds ran out of power, but no, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for Terry, uh, from Kim Tayeb, thank you, Terry, for sharing all this information. As a two-spirit, fan-passing individual, La Lista is super needed. So thank you so much for sharing that, Terry. Uh, so many questions for Edward James Olmos. We really can't get them all. Uh, and so many people that, that chimed in from different parts of the United States. A lot, of course, Tejanos, fellow Tejanos, uh, also from Minnesota, from San Antonio, <laughs> from, from pretty much everywhere. Uh, and uh, But we try to share information on Latino Book and Family Festival. It's in the, the chat and it's in the comments section on the Latino Literacy Project, on Latino Public Broadcasting. All this information is there for everyone to share, to get something out of, and to uh, to work on your dreams. As Edward was saying, you got to work on your dreams with those four uh, powerful messages that uh, I'm sure we've all memorized, uh, except for me because <laughs> I didn't write them down. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but uh, just uh, one really, uh, I think, real. Uh, a critical question, at least from Kim, having spent so much time mentioning your family and community's relationships with religion and spirituality and having a Hindu deity statue in your backyard space, what is your current spiritual practice, uh, Eddie? Well, it's just spiritual. It's a, my spiritual practice is spiritual. I get spiritual awareness and understanding from almost everything, a tree, from a butterfly, from walking down the street and seeing a person, you know, I get inspired and in understanding of my spiritualness and my understanding of who I am as a person. And uh, I, I'm here with my my son lives here, and he's a, 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 a uh, well, he's he's a Buddhist monk. He's he's uh, he's a, a, a sensei, and I, I'm very proud of him, and uh, I, I thank him for for helping me understand myself better and you know he's my firstborn so hey, he's an amazing amazing human being and boy you talk about giving to others and understanding how to share the light see because that's the key terry does it i'm going to go visit terry man i want to come terry i'll be there at your office i'm going to come visit you and, and uh, say hi and get together and connect our powers yeah. and our understanding I, I would love that. <laughs> I, I would love it too. So we will do that because I have a lot of things that I have to get done and, and I need help. And you are just perf in perfect place to help all of us, Terry. You're in the writer's guild. There's nothing more important in any art form than the writer. Nothing. I don't right. care what they say about the producer, the star of the movie, the star of the television show or the, you know, the engineer or the, the cinematographer or the director that it's all doesn't go anywhere 
without the person who writes it down. So writing is the key ingredient to life. And that I'm very proud of you, Terry, and I'm very, very honored to be here with you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jose Luis Ruiz, thank you so much for your kindness and your respect. And Abelardo de la Peña Jr., you have done so I, How long have I known you, dude? I, I go back to go back to before Zoot Suit, man. I think we were together. I think you and I were together with with uh, with uh, uh, what's the Jesus Trevino in, in, in uh, back in those days. Remember those days? Oh, in fact, we have Jose, Jesus Trevino who who chimed in with a with a question here. You might want to answer briefly here. Uh, what do you think about the Selena series on Netflix? I didn't. I, I couldn't watch it. I was afraid to, man. I, I, I heard so much about it. I said things about it. I said, I don't even want to go there. I just pray that they, that they continue to understand that, you know, she was a brilliant, beautiful person. And I don't know. I, I, I never watched it. I, I couldn't. Okay. I think that, that what, what Gregory Nava did and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what he did, uh, was amazing with Barbara Martinez that the both of them have created some great pieces of art and work and they both did worked on Selena and, and Gregory did a wonderful job of writing and directing and uh, we helped produce it and all I can tell you is that like you said Terry I, I opened the door I had to learn how to write I had to learn how to produce I had to learn how to act I had to learn how to you know sell my I had to learn how to do uh, promotion, publicity. I had to learn how to uh, distribute. I had to learn because they wouldn't do that for us. They, they, you know, to this day, they're still not doing it for us. I have a film out right now that is a beautiful piece of work that nobody's seen. It's called Walking with Herb. Herb. I've, I've seen it and I'm oh. a fan. <laughs> that movie with George Lopez and me George play. Lopez, right? George, 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 yeah. George plays the messenger from God. He's an angel, like a messenger, and, and and it's so fun. He's so good. He's a dramatic. It's a dramatic piece. Very funny, but he's very seriously. Uh, it's a it's a faith based uh, movie. I, I didn't know we were making a faith based movie. We were making. I did it because uh, you know uh, Mark Medoff, who wrote uh, uh, Children of a Lesser God, a brilliant writer, wrote this piece for me. And he asked me if I would perform it. And I, and I read it and I said, wow, what, a, what an honor. I'd love to. And then George got on board. And, and boy, it was just a wonder with uh, Kathleen uh, Quinlan, who won Academy Award nomination for uh, uh, Apollo 13. Uh, and so basically, all I can tell you is our future is looking much brighter than ever before because we have a whole new political structure which has eliminated a lot of the pressure of, of discrimination and prejudicism, but it just brought it up to the forefront. Uh, the, uh, the difficulties that we're about to face are gonna be pretty intense. So everybody hold on, keep the faith. And, and as far as uh, uh, Jesus Trevino, what a genius. That man is a genius. And uh, I, I remember working with him when I was just a, a young kid uh, before Zutsu. And uh, I played uh, Santana, uh, General Santana, Santa Ana uh, for him, you know. And uh, I, I gotta tell you, what a, I, I appreciated that man so much. He's one of the giants in directing and in, in, uh, using the medium. He's a brilliant, brilliant director. So to all of you, thank you so much. I gotta go eat. And it's right. getting dark out here. I'm going in. It. It's yeah. getting dark. It's cooling down finally. Thank you so much to everybody that, that uh, joined us and in Casa Con La Plaza. Terry, it was great seeing you again <laughs> after all these years. I hope to see you in person real soon. Dr. Jose Luis Ruiz, thank you so much again for hosting these programs, making it possible for all the community to learn more about uh, our, our great culture and our contributions to society. And, uh, and, and check out the website. I... Put it down as well for, for the Mexican American uh, Cultural Educational Foundation to learn more about the scholarships, the filmmaking scholarships. And of course, Eddie, uh, thank you so much again for, for being here for the community. I think uh, the, the, I mean, thank you for the awesome insight in your life. That's some, one of the comments here and so many great insights. Uh, your experiences have really benefited us all. Your, your um, just your perseverance. And, and everything else has really inspired us and keeping us going. And if you want to watch the original Selena, 
We're showing it at La Plaza, <laughs> con la, at, at, no, no, actually at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. We're opening up our programs finally starting next month. So let's see, we have it coming up in August. Uh, Selena, we're, we're hoping to get a panel going uh, to talk about it. Definitely some, uh, we already have a Selena tribute band booked, some Selena uh, 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 drag performers performing. <laughs> so it's gonna be a full-fledged, great uh, experience for all. <laughs> So, so <laughs> check us out at lapca.org. You'll get all of our calendar of events listings there, also on our Facebook page, also on our YouTube page. If you didn't catch this entire program, or if you want to see it again, and you want to see Eddie with Dan Guerrero's happy hour, catch us all, catch them all on our YouTube channel at La Plaza LA. So that ends today's uh, special uh, in Casa con la Plaza session. Thank you to all. Have a great yeah, dinner, Eddie. Thank you, thank you again, Jose Luis. You, Please we'll talk soon. Terry, I hope to see you real soon. Y buenas noches a todos. Thank you for joining us. Thank Pasen you. Que Dios los bendiga. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you all. Thank Adios. You. Adios a todos.